So my next speaker, speaking of particle interactions, if anybody here is familiar with the, the Higgs boson, um, it's uh, from a little company called CERN. They do maybe important work for the world. Um, my next speaker is Olaf Baring from CERN, who's here to talk to you about what CERN is doing with Open Compute and OpenStack. So please help me welcome Olaf Baring from CERN. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Cole, and the Open Compute Foundation for uh, inviting me to give a keynote here. It's very nice. Uh, so I'm from CERN, uh, and my specific respons responsibility at CERN is um, to buy computers for the data center. And um, so what I'm going to explain to you today is a little bit how we do computing today at CERN, um, and uh, in particular how the scientific communities can use our infrastructure for doing their important science. Um, and then I will see, uh, together with you, a little bit how that maps onto open compute and how we can sort of, how we think we can use open compute uh, as an alternative to our current infrastructure in the future. Okay, uh, first, uh, one slide about CERN itself. Um, it was founded 60 years ago, not far from here, actually. Uh, the signature for uh, the uh, first council um, that was met, uh, that met here in Paris at the uh, OECD um, uh, offices in, in central Paris. And this year, actually, there was a big celebration in July to celebrate this signature and that CERN has been such, uh, such a successful uh, organization for science in Europe and also now all over the world. So uh, you see some figures. We have uh, not, um, not really, but almost 2,400 staff. Um, and uh, we also have temporary uh, fellowships and, and technia students. And uh, the most important is that we have um, about 10,000 users, uh, which are the scientific communities coming to CERN doing their science. So CERN is really a facility for high energy physics, uh, that we prefer to call it, um, which is really about part uh, generating particle collisions. Around these collisions, the scientific collaborations, which are worldwide collaborations, build our detectors, and that's part of the science which is delivered from CERN. Um, our flagship is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. You may have heard of it in, in the press, in particular two years ago when there was an announcement of a particle found in two odd experiments in, on this machine. Um, here you have just a uh, 3D type of uh, diagram on how the machine itself is situated in, uh, compared to CERN uh, uh, and the organization, the CERN site, which is on the border between uh, France and, and Switzerland. Uh, it's between 100 and 150 meters underground, and there are four major experiments, Atlas, Alice, uh, CMS, and LHB. Um, if you look at it from the airplane, uh, when I took off from Geneva this morning, this was not really what I saw because it was dark, but um, you, uh, you see the Geneva um, uh, city with the, with the airport and the Geneva Lake uh, to the right of that. And traced on, the, on, the, on this map, you see where this accelerator is, is uh, uh, situated. It's, of course, underground, so you don't see it, but um, it's uh, traced on, on the ground like this. So it's a quite significant installation. In fact, the tunnel is not new. It's uh, 20, 25 years old. It was built for the previous accelerator called a large electron po positron collider, the LEP. Um, the four experiments, as I mentioned before, ATLAS, which is the, uh, the, by far the largest experiment in, in volume. It's like a, a five stores building, I think, and they, they really had to uh, increase the size of the cabin when it was installed because it was designed uh, a little bit uh, too small for this experiment. The heaviest one is CMS, which has a very heavy magnet. Um, then we have the ALICE experiment, which is a little bit smaller, um, still quite significant. And the, the smallest is the LHGB, which is a forward uh, type of, of uh, detector for detecting specific signals in the B channel of the, of the different decays that we see in, the, in this uh, physics. Okay, um, the machine itself is two pipes, 
um, one where you have proton going in one direction and another one where you have proton going in the other direction. And uh, to, in order to make sure that you can bend those particles so that they go in this circle, you need magnets. And for that, we have uh, CERN has designed and manufactured together with a worldwide industry of superconducting magnets. Um, magnets like this that you see on, the, on this picture. We have about 1,300 of those underground. They are um, uh, eight Tesla magnets. Uh, it's uh, cooled down to uh, the absolute uh, zero almost, uh, so that we can have liquid helium in them in order to cool the, the, um, the, uh, the, the contactors. Okay, now I have a series of animations show a little bit more details about this machine. Uh, so the LHG itself uh, is 8.6 kilometers. I don't know what that makes in miles, but somebody can certainly figure it out. Um, in diameter, uh, that uh, gives you a, a circumference of about 28 kilometers. Every proton in this machine during a normal run of the LHG will make a round trip to Neptune uh, during its lifetime while you, that run is, is going, going on. Uh, that's usually 10 hours. In the collisions when the proton, the ones who actually doesn't make it for this, uh, its Neptune trip, um, they collide and when they collide they generate the, in a very small volume of course a very high temperature. And then you have a very low temperature in order to cool down the magnets. And um, then, of course, we should uh, remove all air, because otherwise the particles will just collide into the air and we lose the beams quite quickly. So therefore, you also have a vacuum which is uh, about 9,000 square meters, I think, uh, cubic meters. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, atmospheric pressure is uh, about 10 one-tenth of that of the moon. And, and finally, uh, the uh, beam itself is quite a, a significant beast, in fact, because it contains a lot of energy, so we cannot just dump it anywhere. We have a special facility for just dumping the beam when the beam is aging out. Okay, in order to do something useful with the um, uh, particle collisions, we build detectors. Um, uh, so in this animation, you, the observant uh, in the audience may have already noticed that we have four experiments, so there should be four points where you have collisions. For the animation, um, which is just a ruthless simplification of the model, uh, I only put two in order to simplify it a bit. The particle detectors typically look like this uh, sandwich type of uh, cylinder that you see on the right here. Yeah, it's on the right for you. Um, that uh, contains concentric circles of different type of detector elements. And each one of these detector elements have millions of sensors, so you get a very high aggregate type of, of uh, uh, scientific data out of this. And in order to handle all of that data, we need some sort of filtering, because if we would be co to collect all of it, it's about 100 terabytes a second. So uh, in order to do that, uh, the uh, physicists have invented custom electronics. They basically use uh, very fast um, uh, custom designed electronics for doing this, where you take fast decisions that can be such as it observes in a very um, uh, concentrated region within each one of the detector elements whether there is some significant amount of points or sensor points which could be combined into a track, for instance. That could be one of the trigger decisions. And once it's taken its decision that to keep the event, it uh, sends it away to a second level filtering, which is a, uh, usually done in a compute farm. And that is actually at the experiment sites themselves. So they do have their own compute farms, which is not my concern. But of course, I talk to them as well. And they might be as well very interested in open compute. And finally, when they filter all the data, they send it to us. And the rate we get the data is about 25 petabytes a year. Now, the machine is not running all the time, so what we see is sort of an a average rate when the machine is running of about 10 gigabytes a second from the four experiments aggregated together. And when it arrives to us, the first thing we do is to put it on disk and make sure that we have a safe copy on disk and a safe copy on tape. So we have a fairly substantial tape archive. There are not many people in the world who still have tape archives, but CERN thinks it's a cheap and energy efficient and actually quite reliable method of storing data for a long period of time. 
once we've done that, we have a safe copy of the data. The experiment on their side, they can actually remove their copy, which they have in their online buffers. Um, and then we make sure to distribute one copy of the data, at least one copy of the raw data, to uh, what we call the grid. So we have set up our own um, LHC computing grid, and uh, where there are um, about 160 or 170 uh, nodes uh, in terms of uh, tiers, uh, different types of computer center, universities, and so on. We have uh, 11 large uh, tier one institutes. Uh, in fact, I think there are actually 12 now. Um, and some of them get the whole full set of raw data from one experiment. Uh, others get fractions of it. But what the experiments tend to make sure is that there is at least one distributed copy of the raw data somewhere in the world. And finally, uh, in our computer center, we also support the 10,000 users that I talked about in the beginning. And uh, a lot of the processing which uh, goes on to prepare the data for the scientific analysis is actually happening at CERN as well on the clusters that we are running. OK, uh, a little bit about the inventory. So as you can see, it's nothing like a Google or a Facebook. It's just quite a reasonable, reasonably small site in, uh, in computer center. We started to uh, use a co-location uh, also because we couldn't expand our power infrastructure any further where the computer center is built. So uh, in Geneva, we have a limit of 3.5 megawatts to our computer center. And uh, in order to cope with the um, additional uh, needs, we, we actually went out to do it and did a public procurement of a co-location facility in Budapest. And there we are starting to grow now. So we're operating that just an extent, as an extension to our data center. You also see some data about our tape archive as well as some of the networking. By the way, two, between these two data centers, the one in Geneva and Budapest, we have 200 terabit, 100 gigabit sorry, uh, network links, uh, international network links going uh, in a redundant way through Europe. OK. Um, we are doing bulk uh, scientific computing for the scientists, uh, and it's in fact they are in charge of their own applications. So we don't really know what the what what the application is doing to our processes and, and storage, but uh, we provide that mostly as a platform um, uh, where they can submit their jobs. So it's a sort of a batch queue, and uh, in fact most of the work notes now in that batch queue uh, or in that batch system or virtual machines provisioned by OpenStack. And for, we have a base node type for that, which we just call the base node type. Um, but there are a number of customizations to support the different parts of the infrastructure. So we have, for instance, a forwarded disk storage, which is just servers with uh, SAS HBAs, which we attach JBODs. Uh, for that, we need uh, also 10 gigabit connectivity, whereas the base node doesn't have any. So we need some customization to that. Uh, for the tape server, we need a fiber channel card because uh, the tape devices are fiber channel devices. For TSM, which is the backup system that we're using for all our enterprise data, our business data, and also a lot of the databases, um, there we also have to have a, um, a, an additional SAS HBA because it has a disk pool be or a disk uh, JBOD behind it. Uh, and then we have the Oracle data servers, uh, which uh, needs four uh, network ports, 10 gigabit ports, two for the private network and two for the public network. We have a, some sort of HPC going on at CERN, although CERN is not really an HPC site, I would say, for, because the scientific computing itself is actually embarrassing, embarrassingly parallel. So in fact, you can just distribute it on the nodes every node independently processing the different events. But there are, in the engineering area, for instance, to design the, uh, this wonderful machine that we have, which is the, the accelerator itself, and a lot of the infrastructure around it, we need uh, HVC uh, commercial applications running in, on HVC clusters. And we also have some lattice QCD going on. And this is actually a growing sector as well now in, at CERN. And more and more of the scientific computing itself is also going into this area. And then we have an infrastructure of uh, Windows machines for the exchange and DFS and everything. And uh, finally, we have something we tend to call Fat Cloud, which is more a, a, a more um, bulkier node, which uh, is, su is suitable for heavier applications, which uh, usually are provided by the experiments. They have a lot of infrastructure services that they use to distribute the data over the world, to build their software, et cetera, et cetera. 
So our challenge is to make sure that we can do all this with a ever-decreasing engineering effort. And we, we try to achieve this um, by using the same platform for everything, and we just customize it, adding cards and so on, wherever it's needed for the, uh, to achieve these different node types. <clears throat> OK, some of the sustainment aspects here, which uh, entangles a little bit into what I said about the platform customizations. Uh, we have a slowly evolving machine park. So in fact, CERN is not just going out and buying a new data center every year or, or, or filling it with new equipment every year. We, we trickle in about 10 to 20% annually uh, in a type of sort of refresh cycle. We start, it, it tends to be that uh, we, we meet the experiment's requirement for compute and storage uh, fairly well, riding on the Moore's law sort of um, uh, exponential increases. So that means that the number of nodes is actually staying more or less fixed to 10 to 11,000 in total. Uh, we have a lot of aging and old equipment uh, where we cannot get rid of some of the applications because they started there and they are so critical now that they cannot move anywhere. It's, it's a uh, complicated area. Our um, maintenance uh, is on site uh, um, uh, a contractor that we contracted ourselves. We used to ask our suppliers to do that for us before. Uh, it didn't work out very well. Uh, some of them came with very good support, some of them came with very bad support, and since our procurement rules forbid us to do um, a uh, best value for money for supplies, we couldn't really cope with that situation. So we decided we insource all of that, we, we contract our own contractor to do the maintenance work. Um, we uh, provide the repair instructions for that um, uh, contractor, and we also debug the intricate issues ourselves. So if there are very system uh, some systematic issue, we follow it up with the original vendor equipment and try to make sure that it gets sold. Something we start to see a little bit more and more now is also that nodes tends to be purposed and repurposed. So we have a... Uh, a node starting in a role some, in some service somewhere, and then suddenly that service is partly decommissioned, or it's less important than it was before, and the node needs to be moved into some other service. And, um, and in order to do that, you need to customize it maybe a little bit differently. So you, you need to cope with that situation. And also within the service itself, the workload could change. For instance, the fat cloud was just an evolution because we started to get a heavier workload which couldn't be achieved with a, with a thin cloud node. So we start to see that more and more. We have to cope with that as well. Now, so that brings me all the way into why we actually need open compute and why we started to look at it. Well, our first thinking when we heard about the announcement in 2011 that Facebook went out and did this, I said, well, this could be interesting because if it's a really an open design and just anybody can implement it, it's, it's good because then as a customer you, you have different sources for the same type of, of thing and you can just make sure that your manufacturers are in, in competition. So for public procurement, that's really ideal. Um, and then for my engineers, it's of course very good to have sort of a single set of uh, IPMI uh, commands uh, that have all the same type of answers so that when we do the monitoring of the nodes, we don't need to have one different uh, if def whenever there is uh, some, some special text in, in each of the output from the, from the IPMI um, uh, monitoring commands. So, so that's also interesting. It saves me some technical effort. It's community driven as far as we can understand, and now there is a significant industry backing. Actually, it was really from the beginning. Intel was there, for instance, and, and Rackspace. Um, and uh, it's, uh, there is a growing manufacturing and supplier ecosystem, which is, of course, also interesting for us. And uh, there is a growing private uh, consumer space, which is generating volume. The question is, is there any public consumers in here and, uh, at this point in time? Because CERN is a public institution, we have to follow the public procurement rules. So we started to look into this. Uh, we bought two high 1500 uh, OCP twin servers two years ago that we started to test. These were equipped with the Sandbridge E5 um, uh, 2650, I think. Um, and we found it was quite comparing quite good with a other platforms we had, so we said, this is really interesting, we should look further into this direction. 
And um, so that motivated us to start a little project to actually acquire a little bit larger installation and something which is more truly UCP because this was a retrofit into a 19-inch form factor. And last year, there was a very intriguing uh, announcement uh, from the UCP summit in, in January 2013, and it had a world disaggregation. So this is more this integration because this is my son's Lego collection uh, after he been angry on something. Um, the announcement that we read and we interpreted in our um, environment is that we could actually dis start to disaggregate components. And this sounds like um, you could in the future perhaps foresee to do some of these different customizations that we have to do when we repurpose nodes, for instance. Uh, more in a software-defined way rather than have to go and slot in a new card in the machine. So, of course, this would be uh, saving even more engineering efforts on our side, so therefore this is interesting. So, our approach to, to OCP now is that we went out and, uh, and announced a public procurement. And uh, we are in the RFI phase, so we are uh, asking for interest. We, we are actually at the end of that, so we received quite a few responses. Uh, one of the peculiarities of, of CERN and uh, most of the European institutions' uh, procurement rules is that we have to have some origin of the equipment from a CERN member state. I'm coming to that in the next slide. And um, once we have sort of collected all the answers, we started now to work a little bit in parallel on the RFP. So. Uh, uh, I have a colleague here, someone in the, in the audience probably, who, who was here also yesterday. He's going to be one of the key people in actually setting up the technical requirements that we need for in the specification for this tender. And the target we have is to set up a little open rack type of environment uh, and fit it into our data center. Uh, for about 60,000 HEP spec. Uh, of course, nobody knows what a HEP spec in is in here unless we have some of our current suppliers. Um, a HEP spec is sort of a, um, a spec int or a spec CPU 2006 uh, with a configuration which scales pretty similarly to the scientific applications. So that was some effort to actually verify that um, a couple of years ago. And uh, today a uh, Haswell, so a E5 2630v3 for instance, delivers about so we do our platform, delivers about 350 um, HEP spec. So if you make out the math here, this would amount to between four and six OCP racks fully populated with servers. Okay, so I'm actually um, in the beginning of an uh, unknown area, and um, we are pointing ourselves into the unknown and cold dark here. Um, well, we didn't really perceive it like that, but it's for, for, for an institution like CERN, where we really have to obey to all the public procurement rules, it's a, a risk every time you have to change anything in the way you are, you are acquiring things. And we've been acquiring servers for 10 to 15 years now in the same way as we're doing today. So how are we going to map this into open compute, and how is open compute going to map into our procurement rules? Well, that brings me to the conclusions, and the which is basically the essential challenges we see now for the next couple of months, years maybe. Um, open compute itself, um, is it available for public procurement in Europe? Well, we have to see. Um, one thing there, uh, which is uh, entangled into the RFI, is how should we qualify a supplier for our tenders, to, to bid to our tenders? Well, we said, well, why don't we just ask for the supplier to be a solution provider? Well, that's very simple. Now, the problem is that it's probably too restrictive for our rules. We cannot just go and buy from the US or Taiwan. We really have to have some component of the manufacturing happening here somewhere in the, in the certain member state, like France, for instance. So, and we don't allow just box moving, so resellers doesn't count here. I mean, it really has to be some significant, it could be a sort of, for a typical server, what happens is that they get the bare bones and slot in the memory and the disks and packages it and test it and, and make sure that it works. So something like that we would like to see an OEM doing for us in, in Europe for, for OCP. 
Okay, um, then I looked at the membership fees and in particular what was required for a solution provider and I realized it amounts to some money and in fact if I'm not mistaken it's 150,000 US dollars a year. That's between one and two percent of a typical CERN supplier and they wouldn't just do that uh, for us uh, or if they did they, that would just be added to the bill. So the key question is, is will the economy of scale um, also scale down to small customers like CERN? And can OCP gear down from the hyperscale? So when there is not just Facebook and Rackscale, Rackspace, sorry, <laughs> and, and uh, Microsoft and, and, and other people like that, um, small institutions, scientific institutions. CERN is fairly big for being a scientific institution, but it's a small public customer. There are governments as well. I don't know. I mean, this is what we're going to get an answer on for the next couple of months. For CERN itself, we have a couple of challenges as well, because we have an infrastructure which is sort of built for standard servers. We realize now that we should, in order to use the OCP uh, rack uh, efficiently and the DC distribution that it can provide for us, we actually need to go up to a little bit higher power densities. So currently we work somewhere between 3.5 and 10 kilowatts per rack. But in the area we're going to put the OCP racks, we only have 3.5 kilowatt per rack. That's just peanuts to a normal uh, hyperscale uh, um, uh, data center. Um, but uh, going up to this power density, we also make sure that the air cooling is efficient enough. We have a refurbished data center from, uh, which has been hosting mainframes, crays, and you name it, throughout the last 40 to 50 years. Um, and it has in one of the uh, peculiarities with a, with, a, with a data center is that we have a very high ceiling. So in order to organize the efficient work, uh, airflow here, it's complicated. We managed to do it for the installations we have today, so we probably have a PUE which is at least less than two now. Um, but it's uh, going to these power densities, it's going to be an interesting challenge. Another thing that we noticed in the um, hardware that we tested from, from Hive is that it's going to be difficult for us to achieve a KVM over IP unless we use a zero line, which we don't tend to use. Um, so that's, I mean, we probably have to cope with that some way. And uh, then there, is also, there was also a lack of storage redundancy, and I don't know if this, this is still true for the, for the OCP version 2 or version 3 type of platforms. And with that, I'm actually concluding my presentation here. So I think it's stopped. Yeah. Thank you.